Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Frank Vukovic. Frank is a director of strategic partnerships at FastPass, which is a leader in audit, compliance, and security solutions for mid-market companies. This is our second interview with Frank, and you can listen to our first interview, which we had in September last year, where we discussed mainly the topics of security controls. Uh, Frank, thank you for coming to our interview today. Yeah. No, thanks, Boris. Appreciate the opportunity again to chat with you. Always look forward to it. All right. So with the end of COVID restrictions in sight, uh, many businesses are planning on having their employees uh, return to, to the office. Uh, but things have changed. Some employees will work from the office uh, while others will stay working from home or only work uh, kind of in, in the hybrid situation, back uh, part-time uh, in the office, part-time home. As right, much as right. the pandemic uh, has affected the work environment, the return to the office will cause similar disruption with a new normal. And our today's discussion, we will cover some of the security concerns that the new hybrid uh, work environment will create. And we will do a little bit a uh, deep dive on some concrete steps that uh, many of our listeners can implement in their companies, especially in the topics such as uh, securing a business application, balancing internal versus external threats, and what, what does true uh, and security controls mean in today's world? So, Frank, can you tell us a little bit what you have been up to since we spoke last year and what's something new you learned in this couple of months that you will be glad to share? So, no, absolutely love to. So, uh, when we last chatted, COVID was still uh, uh, quite the concern, and not that it isn't still a concern, but it was uh, uh, from a, a graph perspective, probably still going this way. Uh, Things have changed. So from a business perspective here at FastPath, uh, we've been fortunate enough to come through the, the backside of it pretty well. Lots of customers still interested and still have the need for security solutions like we offer from a GRC perspective. And, and I think that's an indication of the market has really started to look closer at security at the person level, wherever they might be. Uh, terms like end-to-end -end point security. Uh, how do we now keep track of our users working from home. And when you and I talked before about security at home, we, we talked about concepts like uh, a computer at home that's shared by the family. And maybe the son or daughter doesn't understand what a phishing email is. And maybe they load software under their machine that mom or dad's using to connect to the company network and bad things are happening. That hasn't changed. But what I have seen in the last couple of months is, is an increased confidence from an IT perspective that we can educate those people at home. We can put the right tools to manage more remote devices in place. And we can, we can make sure some of those threats we talked about in the COVID world from working from home can be mitigated to some extent, maybe not hundred percent, but at least we, we've learned if, if you remember, you and I talked about the strain on help desk uh, when everyone started working from home immediately and how larger corporations were better, uh, better able to handle, they had more people when, when all of a sudden, uh, Jane Doe has a laptop on her kitchen table and has never had to use a computer before at home. She struggled and help desk got swamped with calls. Well, now we're past that. People are more comfortable, help desk are more comfortable supporting a remote workforce. So when we talk about this quote hybrid, fundamentally it's not dramatically different what you need to do control wise than what you had to do in COVID when your whole workforce was working from home. You're securing the devices at home you're educating everyone that's using those devices at home. You're locking down your home network wireless wise. And, and the hybrid part comes when the when Jane Doe or John Smith picks up the laptop, uh, maybe goes back into work. Maybe they leave the laptop at home, goes back into work. They as a person, a persona, don't change what they're doing with the computer. And the computer is either staying at home or now it's at work or going back and forth. But the tools and technology and how you're supporting that does not change. So I think the big lesson I've seen the last couple of months is that IT departments feel much more comfortable. They can handle this remote workforce. And now if they're hybrid, great, but we're not going to treat them any differently. What they're doing at home is what we've educated them and we've locked down the tools. If anything, hybrid allows us now to have that home computer brought into the office. We can, IT can run some tools, technology, to double check the setup on that computer that maybe they were doing remotely in the past and get some more consistency there. And then, then when the person takes that computer back home to work from home in this hybrid world, they can feel more comfortable about actually what's on that computer and the, the, the health check they've done of it. But it's not dramatically different. The tools and technology were there, but now it's easier to apply them because we've learned so much. 
we've had more time. We've staffed up. We've adjusted business processes to deal with a large workforce working from home. Mm. Okay. So what does a true enterprise security mean for you? If you, oh. if you go deep, deep into yes. the so, topic. One of my favorite topics and, and at FastPath, all we do is sell software and we sell software to help provide controls for your business applications, whether it's SAP, Oracle, NetSuite, Microsoft Dynamics, Coupa Workday Long List, where we sell software to add controls that are missing or very near manual. That's great. Uh, but when I hear companies talking about enterprise security, when I hear vendors talking about enterprise security, uh, when I go to trade shows and conferences and, and speak at events, the term enterprise security of those folks is external security. And what can we do to stop cybercrime and hackers and ransomware and phishing emails? It's this broad view that this threat landscape is so broad, we have to have all these tools to provide, quote, enterprise security. But no one's talking about enterprise security in the middle, the business applications, or very, very few people, I should say, not no one. But uh, you, need to, you need to lock down the outside threats. Don't get me wrong. And, and there's lots of great tools to do that. You need to monitor the activity. Everything is trying to come in from the outside to your network. And there's lots of great tools to do that. But bottom line, and I think we may have talked about this before, maybe not, 65% of fraud is still internal and still happens inside your company, inside your business applications. So true enterprise security means not looking at just broadly, and the word enterprise means fraud, I get that, but what's inside that broad landscape, including the business applications, your ERP or accounting system, your HCM system, your CRM system, any specialized systems you have to support the shop for, uh, to support the, the, the supply chain, what have you. All these little silos of applications are just as important to secure business-wise. And, and I think that gets lost when CISOs and CIOs are being sold by these security vendors, enterprise security, it almost is always talking about the external threats. And yet certified fraud examiners, Report a Nations Report 2020, it's a great report. If anyone's not looked at it before, it's free, you can download it. It talks about occupational fraud, comes out every year and it consistently talks about the amount of fraud that's internal tied to controls you have internally in a big case and a big bunch in your business applications where the average company is going to have 1.5 million dollars of, of, of fraud this year uh, the average company uh, and a larger company is going to be a bigger number everyone's going to have it and it's all these internal threats so enterprise security means not just keeping the bad guys out but addressing the internal threats to the, the term i use and and we can call it a donut. We can call it a bagel. Uh, I like it a donut. I know donuts can be square now, but when I grew up, donuts, there was only one type of donut. It was yeast donut, and it was round with a hole in the middle. If you think of security, and I talk about selling, don't, don't buy the security donut. A donut has a hole in the middle. The outside of the donut, that ring is, is protecting all those external threats, and, and we're selling in great tools there to stop the hackers and the ransomware and all that stuff to read about, and the CISOs and CIOs want to make sure they stop that but that donut has a hole in the middle and that's your business applications. And what are you doing to secure those business applications? You drop the donut hole into the middle of that donut. Now that donut is full. And now you have enterprise security. The threat landscape has no holes or no gaps in it because you address the external threats and the internal threats, which in reality are greater because that's where most of the frauds happen. Mm. Okay. So, uh, so, how, how the companies need to address uh, these threats, as you said, how, how, what they, they have to uh, adhere to security plan with regards to their business uh, people or process and technology. Yeah. And what are the kind of accent uh, or efforts, uh, focus efforts for CISOs and the risk managers should be? Yeah, yeah. So, so th that's the thing. They're all talking about enterprise security, but when they put their plan together, and do their risk assessments, they have to make sure that they have a nice line item for internal threats and then inventorying their applications and figuring out where the real risk is inside the organization. Uh, I mean, it, it's here in the States, there was a, a saying a long time ago, uh, there was a famous bank robber in Wild Wild West, and I'm drawing a blank on his name now, but uh, uh, they used to say, why did he rob the banks? Because that's where the money was at, inside the bank vault. Same concept holds true here, that the inside is the biggest opportunity for the fraud. So, so they have to inventory all your applications internal. And then you have to determine from a risk perspective what data is most critical, 
where's the biggest financial exposures and the like, that's just a risk assessment exercise. And then you provision the right tools to secure based on this commensurate with the level of risk you're willing to accept. So your ERP or accounting system software has got to be towards the top of the list. There's probably HR data that's very, very important, probably towards the top of the list. Uh, let's say you're a company that manufactures uh, uh, formulas and the like where the, the recipe or the formula is, is your trade secret. Uh, probably need to secure that data at a higher level, right? So, and that's not just, and that's not just the case of a, a financial fraud with in terms of segregation of duties, but that's the case of trade secrets getting out, IP, if you will. So you have to inventory these applications internally, know what data resides in there, figure out from a risk perspective how important it is to your company, and then, then you deploy tools to secure the applications. And, and again, when we talk about securing application, application security, and business application security, it's not just about making sure only the right people have access and, 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 and having a way to provision them securely, that there has to be an approval process. Yes, that's important. But what do they have access to? Uh, certainly in FastPath, yes, we have tools to do that, but it's, it's, it's controls that need to be in place. What do they have access to? What are they doing with that access? Are you looking at segregation of duties and the like? Those are uh, controls that need to be in place. And they're somewhat basic, but again, they're still getting lost here in these business applications because when we do talk about business application security, a lot of it is how can the IT person, guy or gal, very easily set up a new user or change access for user? And that's the extent of the tools they're looking at. And, and single sign-on and identity and governments, that's all great. But what are they doing with that access? And who's reviewing it, either from a preventative control perspective, and can you even push that review up, up further upstream and be a detective control, uh, uh, or preventative control, not a, a detective control, yes, but even better, preventative control, that they can't do certain things if you have the right controls in place. So it's, it's more than just grant access to business application, it's reviewing how they're using that access and what data they're touching. That's truly getting to the level you need to have enterprise security, meaning the threats on the outside and the threats on the inside. And really executives should understand that concept of, a, of, of inventorying their applications, figuring out what the data is where and what's the most important part of the organization and, and spend the dollars, people and resource wise and technology wise to ultimately protect those assets. Because it's critical that that, that application data is protected at the same level commensurate what you're spending to protect the external threats. Okay, interesting. So I would like to hear your personal opinion. Uh, what is the commonly held belief as it relates to securing business applications that you strongly disagree with? I think, and I hinted at a second ago, I, I think it's that securing business applications is more than just provisioning a user. Uh, I've worked on many projects. I mean, I've, I've done enterprise software going back to geez, 20 plus years and working in the security space with it. In many, many projects, and I was guilty of this the first time I implemented Microsoft uh, the ERP product called Exapta way back in 2002, where all we did was move from Oracle to Exapta. What did Jane Doe have access to in the old system? We're just gonna set up the same access to the new system. And then when we talked about security, it was what's the process for setting up a new user? What's the process for changing access, changing their access? It was an administrative function. It wasn't a critical business function that was broad enough to look at the broader exposure of creating that access. So I think that's where executives are, are I don't want to say making a mistake intentionally, but they're overlooking how critical it is when it comes to provisioning security to business applications. It's more than just the physical exercise of creating a new user account or modifying access. It's diving deeper into reviewing what we're giving them access to, the impact of that before you grant the access, that's number one. And then number two, once that access is granted, what tools do you have in place to periodically review what they're doing with that access and look for anomalies? Um, I'll give you a perfect example, and this is one we use a lot. I know St. Patrick's Day is a, is a big holiday here in the States. I know no, it's, it's not in Europe, it's not in Ireland, but uh, it's a huge holiday here in the States. And, and mm -hmm. our CEO, Andy Stuck, has told this story a thousand times. But let's say you have an individual in your accounting department. Uh, if you're monitoring their access, they're, this individual is doing something really strange. He's logged in at 11.30 on St. Patrick's Day night. So March 17th, doesn't matter what year. That's odd. It's a Friday night. He's not normally logged into business software, let's say it's SAP at that time of night. And he's mm -hmm. doing a bunch of transactions. That's odd too, right? And then once starts to thicken, well, St. Patrick's Day night, maybe he had a few green beers. And <laughs> for whatever reason, maybe he's not happy. He's doing something nefarious. 
and he chose to do it on St. Patrick's Day night, thinking no one's going to be watching. Uh, and, and like, if you're monitoring access of your users and looking for those anomalies, Friday night, St. Patrick's Day night, 11.30 with a user that doesn't normally log in past five o'clock in the evening, now you're doing some things that this is application to be more proactive. Yes, it's a detective control, but there's even some stuff you can do now with zero trust and the like uh, from a preventative perspective where if the person's logged in from an IP address that doesn't match with the normal IP address from a country perspective and they're logged in hours that are weird, maybe we lock them down up front and, and zero trust is great at this. So that's your preventative control. They can't log into the system because it looks like they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. So that, that's where I think my biggest beef is, is that uh, when we talk about application security, it's not just make it easier to provision users. That's important and compliant user provision, important and don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. we do that at FastPath too, but it's what are you doing to review the access they have and building that into your business processes? Because if you're not checking up what you're doing, once you give them the keys to the castle, then you might as well give them the keys to the castle up front and not worry about it. Yeah, yeah. I, myself, I was an IT guy about 20 years ago. I remember we had always this critical uh, applications uh, um, uh, kind of uh, work when other people got uh, to the bars and drinking. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. Those things happen. You may not read about it, but they happen. And, and, and don't forget in the COVID world, uh, when, when people lost jobs and the like, fraud's going up because of family needs. And unfortunately, what good people, trusted people, that always done the right thing when they got put in tough situations, family wise, income wise, they're doing things that what we not normally do to take care of their family. So it's even more critical than ever, even coming out of it, that we have the right controls in place to try to catch those things, preferably pro prevent them proactively, but if not, at least have a detective control so we very quickly can work backwards and, and see what happened and, and hopefully rectify the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's discuss uh, where do, do you think the, the application security as a whole industry is uh, heading? Uh, what are the trends in this space and what should we expect, expect from you guys in, in the future? So, so the trend works going, and, and I don't think this is just a, a fad or a, uh, something that's gonna come and go from IT perspective. A lot of times there are terms that, that do. Uh, I mentioned zero trust, but this whole identity access governments governance space, IAG, identity governance, whatever you want to call it, that the fact that what we're trying to do is figure out a way to provision a user once from an identity perspective, know who they are, we know exactly what you have access to, and that's going to more broadly cover all the type of security access you need to have. I think you're seeing an evolution of that. There's lots of big vendors out there in that space, and they're more gradually going from just setting up an individual user to expanding that into what are all the applications they touch. And can we provision security more broadly through one spot? And so we know who they are, we set up their identity, we give them access to what I used to say, the network. Nowadays, it's, it's like Active Directory in 95% of the cases, but access to the network. But that access to the network is not just to get on the network now, it's access to do everything you need to do with your job. And I think you're gonna see that space continue to expand and what maybe were siloed business applications that still had to have security provision individually, albeit tied to that Active Directory account, now it's going to all meld into big one big place where you have a one-stop shop to provision security. And, and I think that's a good thing, but I, I certainly from IT, for you and I both being old, I well, don't take it personally, but people that experience working in IT for years and years and years, uh, I think it's a good thing. It makes their, the IT people's job easier at provision security, but I think we have to be careful that we don't lose sight of inside those business applications have we clearly defined the right roles that need to be available to be assigned to that ID? Have we checked those roles for SOD before we provision them? Uh, these identity access government provisioners out there need to do a better job with that. that setting up someone access to the network is easy, if you will. Uh, granting them access to an, a business application is easy. It's the access mm -hmm. you're granting. Is it appropriate? And that's where I think we're gonna see the evolution of these tools. I mean, there's lots of big vendors out there who do this, uh, but the evolution of tools needs to be deeper into the business application side and not just to make it easier for the IT guy or gal to provision a user. That's great. It's easier for them and you can automate it. Don't get me wrong, but it needs to be the right access and compliant user provisioning principles need to apply where you're checking that access before you grant it for SOD. And, and, and I'm seeing some evolution with Microsoft on the Azure side right now where they want to use Azure to be the quarterback, if you will, to use a, a U.S. football term that for all setting up all accounts 
access to all applications. That's great, but on the backside, you really have pulled in all the roles that are available. Everything that sits in those business applications provision-wise is that all built in. And I, I think you'll see it eventually in the cloud's a powerful tool to allow this all to happen. But I think those vendors need to be very careful that they don't miss out on some additional GRC controls that need to be in place in the provisioning side for business applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I ask this question uh, all my guests uh, because I'm running global risk community, we kind of online community for uh, risk managers and uh, security professionals. Mm -hmm. So my question is how we as a community can contribute uh, better to this uh, uh, div uh, um, complex world of uh, risk management and security. So, oh. so a couple of things there, and I'm a huge fan of community, uh, as you know. Uh, oh. A lot of times we don't talk about some of the challenges or problems we have in public because we don't want bad information out there for people to read on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on, we don't write articles, oh, we got hacked and here's what we learned. Some companies do, but it's, it's we whisper about it, we talk about it behind the scenes. I, I always talk to security professionals, to audit professionals saying, hey, when you're meeting in, in private settings, maybe it's a, a local user group, a local chapter of auditors, uh, get to know your colleagues. Don't be afraid to share a little bit of, of your heartache, your challenges you've had, because what we find out is that we're all struggling with some of the same things. And, and companies and individuals beat themselves up thinking, oh, we messed this up. We did this wrong. Look what happened. And it's stressful and COVID's put more stress on us. But if you talk to your colleague down the street, they might experience the same problem. In some cases, you realize there's not a good technical solution to it. You did as much as you could. You deployed the right tools and it still happened. And at least you can feel like, you know what, personally you can feel better. Maybe your department can feel better. It's, don't get me wrong, bad things aren't good, but there's additional stress. We put ourselves as global risk professionals thinking we could have done more. In some cases, the bad guys and gals just have greater tools and technology, and it's easier to do some of the stuff nowadays, hacking wise and the like, than it used to be in the old days. And you're, you're gonna lose some battles. But one, if we can share our experiences in a way we're comfortable without Again, hurting reputation of companies, that's number one. And number two, I, I think uh, folks can benefit greatly from realizing there's more than one way to do things. Um, and just because you've done it this way all the time doesn't mean you have to do it that way going forward. Let's share approaches. Let's share the tools we've used. Let's learn from each other from a global risk perspective, an IT risk perspective, and, and realize, you know what? There's three tools out there I was looking at for, uh, for compliant user provisioning. I've always worked with this vendor, so I'm going to keep working with them. Why don't you talk, and not, not that people don't do references, but go talk to some of your colleagues. Not, not to be official meeting, just talk to them. What are you guys looking at for compliant user provision? You may learn there's some other things you weren't aware of than these other tools you're looking at. Let's help each other. 99% uh, of us don't need to be competitive where we say we can't trade stories, we can't share secrets. Uh, it's very rare where someone works in the industry and they're good friends with their colleagues with someone in the same industry. We can learn from each other. The tools we're talking about to secure the enterprise from an IT perspective, a risk management perspective, those are not gonna drive more business. Uh, they're not gonna bring more customers in the door. They're not gonna allow us to close more deals, but they are gonna provide a level of security that our company needs. So let's share that because everyone wants their company to feel like they're secure and doing the right thing IT and risk wise. So I, I would just encourage people to listen to podcasts like this, uh, Get active uh, when it's LinkedIn, local chapter groups in your profession, when it's an IA for me or iSoccer for me, which are IT and audit groups, uh, speaking at local software, going to local software conferences and the like. Get active, learn from others in your community. Don't be afraid to share and learn from others. There's more than one way to address this. And I always think that there's probably someone out there that's done it a little bit better than you. You just haven't found that person yet. And that's okay because there's probably other people look at you and say, you know what? What you're doing is better than what we're doing. Can you share that with me? And we work from ever, it raises the time, and then it's a win-win from all from a, a global risk perspective. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, these were all my questions. Maybe if there is something that I forgot to ask you and you would like to add uh, to that contribute to our uh, leader, uh, listeners? I, I think uh, I'll just go back to the donut. <laughs> here in the States, here's a Friday morning. There's probably lots of people eating donuts and, and drinking coffee. Just... When it comes to enterprise security, whether you're an IT auditor, uh, you're an IT professional, a CISO, a CIO, a uh, CEO, uh, maybe you're just in the global risk part of your company. When you hear the term enterprise security, don't eat the security donut. 
don't don't fall in the trap of all the fancy sales pitches and the nice graphics and the stories you read about ransomware and hacking on the news about these external threats. You need to address them, but don't lose sight of that hole in the donut that needs to be filled in. And that's your business applications to truly have enterprise security across the threat landscape end to end. You have to address all the holes in the donut that you might have for business applications. If you can do that, you can truly have enterprise security. You can raise the level of confidence you have from a risk perspective and a, and, a, and a fraud and threat mitigation perspective in your company. And ultimately your executives will be happy. And hopefully if you're deploying the right tools, it's gonna to be easier to administer security for your IT folks. And then the data owners, uh, the people responsible for grant access to data, saying the HR folks and the finance folks, they can have more confidence that their data is secure because you have the right technology in place, you've done the right risk assessment, and you truly have an enterprise security framework in place that addresses the holes in the donut. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Frank, for your uh, very thoughtful interview. And I wish you great success and uh, your company, FastPass, uh, uh, rapid growth. And uh, I hope that we will uh, meet uh, maybe in a few months just oh. to... <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. Like you said, said last time, Boris, I'd love to get together with you in person here if I go over conferences there pre-COVID. Oh. So looking nice. forward to getting over there soon, hopefully. And, and, and yeah. again, FastPath as a company appreciates the opportunity to, to chat with you as always. Know my colleague Pat Wadden was with you uh, on a podcast not too long ago as well. So keep doing the great work you're doing for the global risk community. And, and I appreciate your time today as always and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.